Welcome to this topic on engine fueling control. Uh, we're gonna, so what's our objective here? We're gonna be looking at safety and working with engine fuel. The, just to become familiar with the general concept of the, you know, of what happens, what's our objective? We're trying to get fuel to the combustion chamber of the engines, bottom line. So we're, we're gonna kinda go over the process of what happens when fuel finally gets uh, moved from the aircraft tanks and then through the system. Um, you're going to become familiar with the components that are involved in the distribution of that fuel and also the management of it. The fuel itself, as far as the condition that it needs to be, is going to have to be right clean fuel. You want to make sure it's ice free and you don't want to have too hot of fuel. The other thing too is being aware of the components regarding the metering and the measuring. Okay, there's just different things there. Um, the quantity, so we're talking about quantity of the of the fuel itself. We're going to be looking at where the, some sensors are located uh, for you know how full those tanks are. Also, the weight of the fuel because weight, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot, obviously physics involved with all of this because you have temperature changes and you also have attitude and you know a attitude changes, attitude of the plane is what I'm talking about um, that you know has to be monitored on and making sure that there's a proper amount no matter what attitude the, the aircraft is at you know X number of feet. Also the flow rate, you want to have a certain flow rate um, as it goes into the fuel nozzles to go into the combustion chamber of the engines. Now the application, of course, the outcome, what, what do we want? What's our end objective? Well, obviously to power the aircraft, right? Can't have, you know, aircraft move without fuel. So obviously we, don't, we need to make sure that from point A to point B, from the aircraft tanks um, where we have the fuel, and then being able to move that fuel through a system to get to the combustion chambers of the engines in order to have that thrust. But all that has to be managed. So besides distribu distributing that fuel, we also have to manage it constantly. It has to, you know, the, the computer systems have to be monitoring, monitoring all of that constantly. And then the threat to the entire system, of course, you don't want to have fuel leaks. And one of the other things too is you do not want to have an explosion. Okay, and I mention that because when we're dealing with aircraft. Um, you know, you, you, you probably heard from the, if you listened already to the um, aircraft fuel and inerting, uh, SAR SAR 88 uh, is a federal regulation. Um, there are components that, you know, this just follows with keeping a certain configuration or design of an aircraft, uh, the components that are involved with that to ensure just a, a very low, low probability of, of a fuel explosion. So. You know, I, it's all tied with that. We want to make sure we're, we're very careful. Say we, meaning the machine, so that the computer systems need to be able to, you know, ha be basically working uh, constantly to to do that monitoring. Uh, big thing is locations. I am going to introduce a uh, little bit of differences between your Dash 5A and Dash 5B. What am I talking about? Okay, I'm talking about the CFM 56. If you recall, that's the engines that are installed on the Airbus in particular, we're, we're talking about um, these here. And these, the talking about the A3, A320 family. And the CFM56 has a different variants, but in particular, I'm only referring to the Dash 5A and the Dash 5B. And as far as what components are involved with those two different variants, there's a slight difference, and I wanted to just wait, raise the awareness for you uh, as to what those differences are. Now, keep in mind that with any system, you're going to be dealing with three aspects. Okay, three aspects that we need to be constantly, you know, monitoring, making sure that they're within the green. Okay, making sure that on displays, you know, they're at where we, we need them to be, and not in the red or or amber colors. And that's going to be your quantity. Okay, of course, having the amount, right amount of fuel at any given point in time based on the demand requirements is extremely cr crucial. So that's one aspect is the quantity. Number two is temperature because you don't want to have the fuel too hot or too cold and when it's coming from the aircraft tanks just so you know it's it's I mean it's at the temperature it is whatever that is it's usually pretty it's cool 
and then it has to be going through um, you know certain components to kind of get warmed up a little bit um, pressure affects uh, density so when you're looking at flow rates uh, you know that pressure can have an effect on that and that's why it's very important to you know have those pressure sensors also monitoring to, to ensure that there's the right conditions there before obviously so that it can be going through um, the fuel nozzles you know part of that component and not to the combustion chambers of the engines so that's our job you know that's what your job is you know having making sure that the components are not broken there's not any hairline fractures or anything that's that's creating a threat to the integrity of the components themselves because that's not that's now you know obviously dropping its ability to maintain what it was designed to do and uh, the whole idea is keeping those three aspects the quantity temperature and pressure um, at the levels it needs to be for the safety of you yourself I mean for the safety of aircraft maintenance technicians and also for you know obviously the crew and the passengers on board all right so um, and just keep in mind and, and you you probably already know but you know a lot of times you'll you'll have you know there's there's your procedures and then there's manufacturers recommendations as far as maintenance goes so kind of keep that in mind because maybe you know you want to be aware of what the manufacturer is saying um, that needs to you know be the case as far as um, um, optimal uh, operations okay all right now of course we're gonna have a test there's gonna be roughly about 20 or so questions I certainly could go on and on and continue testing all of you you know by giving you you know 75 or 100 questions for this topic which you know is certainly doable but um, the point here is just make sure you are you know paying attention taking notes as you go along you will not be tested on every single aspect but if you pay attention uh, you'll notice that I will be stopping from time to time in between to ask a practice question hint hint because you may see that on the test and you wouldn't otherwise know what that question was if you weren't following along here in the video all right so let's go ahead and kind of get into this um, there obviously you've got a fuel pump so we got the aircraft tanks and you know covered in fuel and inerting is you know where those there's the three tanks as you if you already covered it where there's three tanks fuel tanks and of course you know the different the two different variants that I mentioned you've got your dash 5a and your dash 5b variants of the CFM 56 now when it comes to later when I start explaining about the HMU which is a very important component okay when I say HMU I'm referring to the hydromechanical unit um, there's there's different servo valves in the HMU and depending on whether or not the engine is the dash 5a variant or the dash 5b variant is going to determine what valve exists or not exists okay in the HMU so again go by serial number obviously go by your you know the ID of the actual component when you're uh, doing a switch out because it's it's extremely critical you're not going to be putting in the wrong HMU um, in the wrong air in the in the in that Airbus that you're working on in particular what I'm referring to is the burner staging valve the burning burner staging valve doesn't exist in the dash 5b and just so you know a little bit if you don't know already uh, the dash 5a is the the first like a first variant then your second variant the second variant is a dash 5b and then there's C and D etc basically what they're doing is they've improved you know with the next letter in the alphabet so dash 5a has a burner staging valve but when they got to dash 5b they they did away with the burner staging valve also kind of the way the platform is for the fuel nozzles in the dash 5a is it's split into two manifolds so you have 10 all you know 10 each you know 10 fuel nozzles each on those manifolds in the dash 5b you don't have two manifolds you only have the one so those are differences you're going to see once you start you know kind of getting under the hood so to speak you're in one um I, i'm not going to mention trim because it's really not important from really from a pilot standpoint from an operational standpoint um but 
you know a lot of things are based on the in-one fan speed uh, so just to kind of keep that in mind when we're talking about power, power management um, when demand requirements are you know we have that input from the pilot uh, everything kind of goes from there on auto you know and then um, that in one you know fan speed is is participating in that um, whole process here um, with the other applications of the fuel system is cooling the IDG oil as well as the engine oil okay so we're going to be talking and looking at those two cooler assemblies and kind of doing a little comparison with those uh, the other thing too if you're on an Airbus that is a Dash 5A has the Dash 5A engine uh, those the locations of those cooler assemblies are slightly in different places so again I, I don't you know it's important to have know where the locations of the components are but don't be so hung up on it um, and say okay this is because you know you could be working on an Airbus that is okay it's not at the seven o'clock it's at the 530 you know it's not the, it's the 530 position so it, you know it's it just depends your distribution of course uh, the idea with the fuel is you want to make sure that, that the, the uh, fuel is ice free you also want to make sure that it's filtered fuel anything that's going to a servo mechanism is has to be filtered um, as far as the fluid and here obviously we're talking about fuel so that's the fluid um, it has to go through the filters and there are several filters along the way um, in the fuel pump and also not just there but also right before it goes to the um, into the fuel nozzles there's uh, there's filters there as well so again you're familiar with the whole idea that you know any fluid that's going through um, has to go through filters so our again job is to make sure you've got that clean fuel um, the fuel flow is uh, going to be going into the cooler assemblies because remember I mentioned before uh, so we have the IDG oil uh, cooling cooler assembly as well as the engine oil cooler assembly and of course your management uh, there's the management is coming from computers um, just like in any system we have those computer systems or controllers of um, the amount of flow okay and also for the applications um, that it making sure it's going to those applications so in management everything starts obviously with the cockpit the input happens there and engine master on say engine master one and two kick on or is, is put on by the pilot and then boom everything just kind of goes from there um, the fuel demands of course are going to be changing as the plane is flying so those are those varying um, conditions in which the management is necessary absolutely necessary in order to distribute the right amount of fuel Okay, so just kind of give you a rundown of the process, and this is a test question, by the way. Um, obviously, the, the fuel's coming from the aircraft fuel tanks. They're going to go through what? Okay, something has to move fluid, and what component does that? All right, it's going to be your, your a pump, right? So you, have, you do have a two-stage pump in this particular case uh, with a low pressure and a, and a high pressure stage and the, at first the fuel is going to go through the low pressure um, through the low pressure valve and then it's driven um, you know by the low pressure stage part of the pump and it's going through that boost stage because right now it just moving or allowing fuel to move or be you know moving um, needs to get pressurized in order to move even further to you know through it down the process so now you have pressurized fuel that's going to go to the oil fuel exchanger remember what I said about the temperature of the fuel that are, that's in the aircraft fuel tanks there it's pretty much cold okay I mean say like cold it's it's just what we call cold right it's just cold fuel it's not warmed up it's just whatever temperature it is and then um, once it gets pushed through but after it gets, gets pressurized it's going to be going through heat exchangers and those heat exchangers are warming up that fuel okay after it's gone through what you know some fil a few filters and then it's going to go through the high pressure stage of the fuel pump okay so with that one we get the high pressure stage part of it where that fuel is and then it's going to you know um, be further filtered because remember once it hits the HMU because that's where he we're heading next is the, the hydromechanical unit 
um, it, it has got to be filtered, period, end of story. And um, so you've got that you know, final filter uh, in the high pressure stage of the pump before heading over to the, um, the HMU. Okay, now on the HMU we'll you know get a little bit more detail when we get to that part. But just to, just so you know, you've got that fuel going through the high pressure part of this of the pump, and then it's going to pass the, pass through a wash filter. Okay, before it goes into the HMU. HMU. Okay. Also, the other thing it, it does besides going to HMU, it's also going to a servo heater. Okay, so you get the servo heater there, and um, the, you know, it's basically you've got a way to um, basically there's, there's servo valves um, being able to kind of correct the amounts of fuel as far as the output um, to the fuel nozzles. And then, of course, the fuel flow um, into the HMU goes through there. Uh, there's a metering valve uh, and then also a flow meter. And then, of course, that goes out to the, like I said, the, the nozzles. Now, what's controlling how much and all that good stuff? Um, obviously, you have sensors in this entire fuel system. And your sensors are going to be whether or not, well, how much fuel do you, do you have, right? I mean, fuel on part, your FOB on ECAM display that a pilot's going to see is like, well, how much fuel do I have at this point in time, right? So there has to be level, uh, level sensors. And we do have that, so um, those signals are going to be going to, you know, the FADEC. We're going to be, you know, if you haven't got to FADEC yet, that's no problem. But FADEC is full authority digital um, electric um, and engine control. You have that component, kind of like the brains of the whole operation. Your ECU is kind of a translator, if you will, it's kind of a translator of signals that FADEC is trying to communicate to the HMU. Okay, so. It's, it's just a kind of a, go, like a you know, middleman, if you will, with the hydromechanical unit. Because I hey, remember the hydromechanical unit, it's called hydromechanical for a reason. Um, it's, it's taking, um, using hydraulic pressure um, and transmitting that and trans converting that energy into mechanical. Because the HMU is, is able to actuate Okay, we have actuators, and that's what it's doing. See, it's sending signals so that we have those actuators for the engine, you know, engine, um, uh, you know, for the engine, so that we can that, that whole thing can go with the uh, with the fuel. So, also the other thing in the uh, hydromechanical unit, just I'm just mentioning a few things with the valves, um, as far as application, is it's also controlling. Cause remember, I said that the brains of it is is the FADEC. ECU is kind of a translator, like a little go-between, um, to send signals to the HMU. HMU then takes and uses takes those signals, uses hydraulic energy to transmit that energy into mechanical, with, you know, over to that. And this is all uh, um, one of the um, operations is for the um, high pressure and also the low pressure turbine active clearance control. Um, it's controlling um, the variable bleed vanes as well. So. That's, that's all another application besides cooling engine and IDG oil. All right. All right, so um, now you've kind of got an idea of the kind of the flow or the, the steps, I should say, the steps of what happens with the fuel coming out of the aircraft tanks, right? And it needs to be pushed. Well, how does it get pushed and moved? We have to have a pump. Got a two-stage pump. pump has some filters, has two stages, your low pressure and high pressure, so that fuel is moving through the system um, and being filtered along the way and also metered before it goes to the fuel nozzles, okay, because that's all going to be, it's constantly being monitored by FADEC, uh, but kind of a back and forth communication um, with the sensors, you know, back to the ECU, etc., um, so that, you know, it, it can give the right amount of fuel. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the fuel pump. Because remember, after the air, uh, the fuel comes from the aircraft tanks, it's going to go through the fuel pump. So let's kind of go over that a little bit. Um, with the fuel pump, 
um, it's like I said before it's it's a two-stager of course and also along with uh, the fuel pump is you know you've got your assembly and remember I mentioned the exchangers that you have etc um, and you've got your fuel return lines um, as well so again I'll just touch on those so you have some familiarity with those but with the fuel pump um, obviously it's there to increase pressure that's its job is to increase pressure of the fuel uh, from the tanks and then that is going to be moving to the heat exchangers um, then it's going to be going to the HMU now where's the engine fuel pump located okay you're going to find of course many of the components are going to be located on the accessory gearbox and in this particular case with engine fuel pump it's on the left side of the drive shaft housing okay now you have a supply line and return line just like everything else when we talk about hydraulics right any system you're going to have supply lines and return lines uh, the fuel supply line um, here is routed through a hydraulic junction box um, that's going to be um, again this is all near the engine obviously you want to be not too far from the actual application which would be the combustion changer chambers of the engine so here you've got fuel supply lines that are routed from that junction box uh, which is on the fan inlet uh, case and then goes down to the fuel pump inlet okay so supply line going to the fuel pump inlet makes sense then you have the return line okay and and there's a return uh, fuel return valve we'll talk a little bit more later about that fuel return valve but for now just know you've got the return line that's going to the fuel return valve okay that's also on the fan uh, the fan case all right and you've got of course the like I said before the, you've got that low pressure part of the pump and then you've got that high pressure part and then you have of course filters uh, within the pump because you've got a liquid there that needs to fluid that needs to be filtered before application um, there is, of course, a clogging condition um, that can be monitored um, on the ECAM. So there's a, a clogging condition that indicates on the ECAM there is a bypass valve, just like in any system. You know, we want to make sure fuel has to, you know, fuel or that fluid has to get through. If for some reason there's a clogging condition, we want to be able to still have that fuel, um, have, have that liquid or fluid go through. So that is what we have as a bypass valve that's installed there. Um, near the filter. Of course, you also have a pressure relief valve. Anytime you have pressure or something that's pressurized, uh, one of the biggest threats is overpressurization. Of course, you could have also likewise, okay, just the same, is you can have the underpressurization of something and still have a problem, right? But we certainly don't want to have an overpressurization, all right? So you've got these flows going to the next component, which is the hydromechanical unit very important part because this is where kind of everything starts to get measured and metered um, if they, and then remember the HMU is receiving messages it's receiving messages from the what I mentioned before was the FADIC and the ECU is a little translator kind of a in-between go-between man so to speak all right on your um, fuel pump uh, obviously it's lubricated by the fuel as it goes through so it's got lubrication there um, you have your main drive shaft of course you've got your drive shafts in each of the stages it's kind of a that's understood um, your HMU drive shaft um, that one is actually driven by the low pressure pump drive shaft and um, all that is then driving again like I said that the HMU okay all right, and there's some diagrams that can help you understand a little bit better how it's uh, put together. Uh, but just wanted you to, you to be familiar with um, the concept of the fuel pump and kind of a, get a skeletal view, if you will, um, with its application based on its design. Okay, you also have an impeller rotation um, that has to be done during troubleshooting. So um, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, those are one of the things you need to be looking for. Remember, I mentioned about the integrity of material. When when you have when you're doing uh, maintenance and you happen to you know have 
something open and you're working in a certain area you know like I said do just do a visual inspection look for things that don't look right maybe a little cracks Th those may seem simple and maybe not a big deal it's something you don't want to pass up because something small can certainly become disastrous as you probably have known if you've been in this industry long enough and of course we've heard of the aircraft accidents that have occurred because somebody forgot to screw something down. So, I mean, it's as simple as that, right? So, with this in particular, I'm talking about the impeller rotation. Um, just do that quick visual inspection and, you know, make sure there's nothing broken with any uh, shafts because that, that certainly would be a big problem. Of course, impellers, you, you know, I want to make sure that that does rotate uh, freely if there's some reason why it doesn't then there's a problem you know we're gonna have to look you may I, I'm not saying do this but that's a heads up you know if something doesn't turn f manually just freely um, and it sticks then you may want to look at the fuel pump to be replaced uh, but I would tell you to f obviously follow your maintenance procedures at your MRO but you know this one thing to to be a little bit aware of you know again remember I mentioned before is, is leaks you you want to watch remember when fuel runs through a system how many different places can it can there be a leak you know where, where a leak can exist okay well practically anywhere in that system and you know certainly you can have a leak in a fuel pump um, so you want to watch for that of course there's natural uh, when the aircraft is engine master engine masters one and two or whatever you know when those engines start start getting when they get turned on then you're going to have a little bit of i should say you know kind of a normal leak a little bit it should not continue leaking so um that would be a sign that you know everything needs to be stopped and um investigated at that point okay all right just kind of a just kind of having you absorb it a little bit but you know just remember FADIC is the brains behind this whole thing or and that's you know those things can be done a lot of tests that can be done um, to you know ensure that there are no leaks or if there are you know it, it, how, to what degree are those fuel leaks all right a uh, little bit on filters uh, of course filters uh, you're gonna have downstream you know in the fuel system in the whole circuit uh, with that and there's different kinds of filters I'm not gonna bore you with all of that because you know bottom line is those filters um, you know obviously need to you know be clean because you don't want to have a clogged filter and then plane goes up in the air now you got a clogging condition you know sure you got a bypass but you know filters need to be you know make make sure they're in good order um, um, so you've got that the uh, installation of the fuel filters you know just have to you know look at again visually uh, making sure that you know they're they're not in a clogging condition that's the biggest thing and of course you have warning remember I said in the cockpit you have warning messages for clogging conditions of filters just that's a big thing just looking for that making sure that they're not in that condition if, if they are obviously it needs to be addressed and uh, and you know replaced okay all right um, then you again you've got indications uh, with the filter um, if there's something wrong you're obviously the master caution lights gonna come on and there's gonna be a chime usually well it's gonna be a single chime sound when there's a problem with that so um, you'll see that on the uh, on the ecam. The other thing too to be uh, concerned, or just kind of just be aware of, is the pressure in the filter. Uh, that's another indication on the ECAM display. If it falls below, you know, starts losing pressure, past a certain uh, um, psi, then you're, you know, there's going to be an indication uh, on the ECAM display. Okay, it's looking for pressure differential um, there, and it's going to again give a warning to that effect. All right, so that's the filter. I mentioned the fuel pump and, of course, the fuel filters that are involved. Uh, the next thing that I want to mention to you is the oil fuel heat exchanger. Because remember what I said, aircraft fuel sitting in the tanks is 
it's cold. Um, and then once it gets pressurized, it's going to be going to the heat exchanger. And again, that's just kind of to warm it up. And it's using engine oil to do that. So with here, um, you've got, you know, an exchange, exchange of energy or, you know, obviously temperature, but, you know, it's energy. Is that you have kind of a cooler uh, fluid called fuel and you're running it through an oil fuel heat exchanger. Well, you know, you've got hot oil or at least warmer oil and you want to be able to exchange that energy. So if, you know, we've got that, now we have the taking away or subtracting of the heat, right, from the oil that's warming up, you know, going or transferring over to the fuel. And that's what we have with this oil fuel heat exchanger. And where is this installed? If you ever had to switch it out, and that was your task, where would you go? Remember, everything's near the engine, so, you know, with here, um, you're going to find that exchanger at the 7 o'clock position uh, in the fuel pump housing area. So that's going to be, again, near that fuel pump if you're, you're wanting to or needing to do maintenance on that. Um, Okay, so just remember that cool fuel, fuel ends up getting warmed up and then warmer oil gets cooled down. All right. All right, and, and you can kind of see um, some pictures of where, kind of how it's, um, I should say, the plumbing of it, of it, if you will, but it just, the, the piping um, is you're going to have that cooled oil that's going to leave that heat exchanger because you know you got oil and the fuel there um, that cooled oil is going to leave there through a pipe in the servo fuel heater before it goes back to the oil tank so that's what's happening with that oil uh, on the, co the cooled oil and again I'll, I'll explain it more when we get to strictly talking about the cooler assembly that's a whole different thing because there's different components you know with that assembly but right now I just wanted to get you the idea of just in general the oil fuel heat exchanger but you do have that pipe for having that oil the cooled the cooled oil, air, uh, oil at that point to just kind of leave that exchanger uh, also what you'll find in the heat exchanger there's a couple of valves um, that are there um, there's one for the fuel circuit obviously and you have one for the um, oil system those those valves are bypass valves okay so if you see those in there those are bypass valves um, and then, of course, there's triggers based on pr uh, pressure differential with the fuel. And that's going to be, be between the inlet and the outlet of the main heat exchanger. So remember, it's comparing pressures. It's comparing two different pressures, um, uh, inlet and outlet of the exchanger. And if that gets too high, okay, well, what's too high? Well, you know, the, the computer is going to know that. When it reaches a certain point, that differential, that difference between those two pressures is too high, then the bypass valve is going to open. Okay, what does that do? It's going to send that fuel out of there, um, out of that exchanger. Okay. All right. So remember, bypassing is just getting it out of the exchanger back to its home, basically its home bases. So with oil back to the oil tank, and then fuel back to the to the um, fuel pump. All right. Then you also have besides the you have the fuel oil heat exchanger you have the heater okay because you have cooled fuel and then you want to warm up that fuel to a certain temperature this is what the fuel heater does it just basically warms up the um, the fuel now the, the where is this located this is going to be on the accessory box between the oil tank and the fuel pump HMU package it's, gonna, it's between those two okay and again, there's some diagrams you'll see in your manual or in the manual where you're, you're where you work um, that will give you an idea with that, and where, you know where that's where that's located. Okay. And um, just to kind of keep in mind differences, because again, dash five A, dash five B. You know, here's another difference. You know, you've got an oil filter with the dash five B. All right. Um, whereas you don't have that oil filter on the heater uh, in dash 5A. So don't freak out if you're like, wait a minute, where the heck is it? Oh, that's right, I'm, I'm, you know, I have the CFM 56-5A in front of me, you know. 
Okay, all right. Now let's kind of go a little bit over the HMU and keep in mind that, you know, it's a pretty important part. I mentioned about metering. Um, it has to be receiving messages from the FADIC, you know, and also the ECU. And it's, it's going to be receiving those signals in order to send those over to the actuators. Okay, so all that then goes to the fuel nozzles for the right amount of spray of fuel into the combustion chambers. So let's go ahead and kind of get into some of this, the valves that are here and, you know, get, just get familiar with what they're supposed to be doing. Um, your hydromechanical unit, by the way, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, with the HMU, you know, if there's something wrong with the, with the hydromechanical unit, um, you're going to end up just, it's an assembly, so you're going to end up just switching it out. But I think it's important for you to be aware of what's inside the HMU, just for knowledge sake, okay, just to have it and to understand better. But basically, the hydromechanical unit, like I mentioned before, is hydro, which has to do with fluid or hydraulics, and mechanical, which has to do with mechanics. And it's taking signals that it's receiving from the ECU, which it gets from the FADEC, by the way, and then transmits those signals into hydraulic pressure um, in order to actuate the actuators, right, that we're talking about for controlling the engines. Okay, so it's all, it's, FADEC controls the power management, but it does it by sending signals to the HMU. HMU is able to kind of break things down, say, okay, I need to measure, you know, it needs to measure the, the, the fuel in, you know, the, it, as to get to the fuel nozzles. So here you've got the calibration. Remember also I mentioned about turbine uh, active clearance control, so that's another application of the HMU. When it's sending those mechanical, send or sending from hydraulic you know, energy to converting to mechanical enter energy, so that, and I'm talking about the actuators, is to also activate um, the variable bleed vanes. So it's all part of the, uh, and the, like I said, the low pressure turbine active clearance control, as well as your high pressure turbine active clearance control. All right, so different functions that you have here is, again, the fuel pressures, because remember I said the, you know, TPQ and be, or, you know, however you want to say the acronym, but, you know, I just I say TPQ because we're talking about temperature, pressure, and quantity. Yeah, your amount. And that's what the HMU's operation is. It's calibrating, it's measuring, and, and kind of, ca you know, calculating what the fuel pressures are. It's also metering the fuel, fuel flow. There's fuel flow, and uh, we certainly could talk about density. Density has a lot to do with flow rate of a fluid. And here we're talking about fuel. And it's important that it goes at a certain rate to the fuel nozzles because you want to have a certain rate at which you, you have that flow or a fuel amount going into the, uh, the combustion chambers so that you have the desired thrust you know, at any given point in time, no matter where, you know, at what point or attitude the aircraft is, is at. Uh, the HMU also has um, a manifold. So you got a manifold for fuel shutoff. Etc. And um, you'll again remember you have an N1 speed. I know I, I mentioned the N1 fan speed, but you also have the N2 uh, uh, overspeed protection because that's the, your internal shaft, by the way. If you remember from just general con construction or understanding of of, uh, of the power plant or the engine itself. Um, so it's providing protection for that and just making sure again that there's the right. Um, amount of um, fuel going to the fuel nozzles. You've got two channels. Uh, you got your A and B. Okay, so you got those connectors to the ECU, your um, uh, electrical control unit. Uh, is that's there. Okay, so just think about HMU is a, the big deal component. I mean, not saying all the other ones, if we didn't have those, of course we have to have the rest of them, but HMU is pretty important with the different operations that it does to get everything over to the combustion chamber. Okay. 
And of course your servo valves, uh, a lot of these valves obviously are run by tor torque motors. So you've got those um, associated with those valves because now you're metering. Remember I said about the metering of fuel, you want to make sure that there's not you, but the HMU is making sure there's enough fuel um, and it's measuring all that. Um, those valves are being operated, like I said, with torque motors um, and you know that's all part of that. You remember uh, I mentioned the burner staging valve in the beginning when I said, okay, here's, the, here's one difference between the Dash 5A and the Dash 5B engine. You have a burner staging valve with the Dash 5E variant. So with the HMU that's installed you know, along with the, um, with the, you know, in the Airbus that has the CFM 56-5A, that's where you, that's where, you know, you're going to have a burner staging valve, isn't that HMU? And, but it doesn't, there's no valve for like that in the Dash 5B that you'll find in that HMU. So just reiterating that reality. You do have a shutoff valve. Obviously, if, you know, it's, at, you know, aircraft on ground or, you're doing maintenance, time to shut everything down. It's going to have that fuel shutoff valve when engine masters uh, switches off in the off position. Okay, so it's stopping fuel. Also, if the AP, or excuse me, if you have the um, fire engine, engine fire, that you have that sh uh, turned on, if there's some threat um, of fire, obviously you don't want to ha continue to have fuel flow. So that's where those shutoff valves come into play and those will shut off the fuel. Okay. All right, so like I like said before, there's different conditions in which you have the sh uh, fuel shutoff valve open. Um, it's going to be, be receiving information from different, you know, uh, um, parts. Or um, the, obviously the rotation of the speed uh, of N2, because you have the N1 and N2 shaft. Um, if you have the N2 greater than 15%, um, that's one of the one of the conditions, you know, that has to be there for the fuel shutoff valves to be, you know, operational, uh, meaning open, by the way. Um, also, just the command to open from the aircraft, okay, pilot wanting that shut off. Um, also, the FADIC is giving commands. So all these three, you know, things have to be there for the shutoff shut valves to be operational. Okay. Um, I want to mention about the transmitter. There's the I mentioned there's a fuel fuel metering valve. You know, the different valves. You get your fuel metering valve. This is in the HMU, by the way. And then you also have a transmitter. So with here, you've got a transmitter that's transmitting information back to, or say back to, it's, it's transmitting information to the ECU. Because remember I said the FADIC is your brains. Um, when the engine, when the pilot switches on, the engine master switches to on, then FADIC comes alive. It's like a, you know, big robot or something. You know, it starts waking up, if you will. And the FADIC is now receiving, like, whoa, well, okay, there's something that I need to do. This is a demand that's wanted, you know, something that's wanted. And for the FADIC, it now is, is activated. And with the fuel flow transmitter, okay, it's going to be sending signals to the FADIC for, you know, saying, you know, basically providing that information for different information. And one of them is going to be the weight of fuel because weight is important. Um, certainly, I, I don't need to detail about the mass because it's really fascinating, but you know, basically you, you want to have the right fuel flow and the weight of the fuel is important um, with being able to, remember I said the fuel, uh, there's a certain condition, the, the, you have to have the flow rate of, of the fuel a certain level to have optimal combustion in the combustion chamber once the fuel gets there. Um, it's the same here with the weight of the fuel. It's all it's all connected. Um, where's this transmitter located? Okay, actually the transmitter itself is outside of the HMU. This is not a valve inside the HMU. This is a transmitter, so it's actually located um, near the HMU, um, near one of the ports and the the filter for the for the fuel nozzles. So it's 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 between that at the seven o'clock. 
Okay, it's towards the back of the HMU, but that's that transmitter is there. Um, you'll see that there. And of course, you have your supply hose, um, discharge tube or hose, and of course, you have to have electrical wiring if you have signals being sent from transmitter to FADIC um, or to the ECU. Okay. Um, cockpit, you know, what does the pilot see? When you're talking about the, me the, the, the metering, you know, of the fuel flow, what indication do we have? You're on the ECAM display, it's going to be in the upper um, part of the display. And if everything's going well, it's green, right? You're probably familiar with that. Yellow means, hey, you know, something's not quite right, but, you know, it's not an emergency or anything yet. But um, it's just, that's where you're going to find that indication. Okay. Now, I know I mentioned the burner staging valve a couple of times and, you know, just remember what I said, which, which variant do you have the per burner staging valve? Is it dash 5A or dash 5B? It's dash 5A, right? I think it's time for a test question. <laughs> okay. So that was the first, that was a practice question slash hello test question. <laughs> okay, when you're comparing components of the variants of dash 5A and by, uh, dash 5B, you have the CFM56, which one of these variant, variants consists of the burner staging valve? Is it dash 5A or dash 5B? Okay, I already covered that. That's right, dash 5A. Um, and just here's another practice question for you. When the fuel leaves the aircraft fuel tanks, and heads over to the boost stage and to the boost stage outlet, what two locations does it go from there? Okay, here are your two choices. The oil fuel, he fuel heat exchanger in the HMU or the oil fuel heat exchanger and the fuel return valve. Okay, it's going to be the first answer. So it's going to the uh, oil fuel heat exchanger and the HMU, your hydromechanical unit. Okay, here's another practice question for you. All right, where is the fuel pump located? You have two choices. Is it on the left-hand side of the drive shaft housing on the accessory gearbox, or is it above the oil tank? Okay, it's the first answer. All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll go back to our lesson. But just start getting, um, note, write down notes, because I'm going to be coming back to some practice questions. Uh, along the way. All right, so burner staging valve. What in the world does this valve do anyway? I mean, especially when you don't see it in the dash 5B. Um, that staging valve, it's like it's staging. It's called burner for a reason, okay, because we're getting ready to hit the combustion chamber, okay, where burning happens. Um, so here, basically, it's delivering, that, that valve is delivering that fuel, okay, now, the nozzles, it could be to every other nozzle, it could be to all 20 nozzles. I mean, it just depends on what the demand requirement is at that time. So, you know, who knows? Just know that it's gonna, that burner staging valve is, is, it's going, it's delivering that fuel to the nozzles. All right. Now, on the one that obviously has it, which is the Dash 5A, um, where is this located? You're going to find this on the core engine itself at the 6 o'clock position. So, again, don't get too hung up, but just giving you an idea. There is a support bracket for this thing, but it is actually on the core of the engine. All right. Um, now, um, that's what you have with the burner staging valve. Um, and remember what I said before. You On the Dash 5A, you have... Uh, two manifolds. So you got ten nozzles on each of those manifolds. Um, and of course you've got mechanical coupling for those. So again, just giving you an idea of the platform for this on the Dash 5A. Okay. And you got some fortification there, just kind of the way the design as far as the uh, fasteners. Fasteners, I'm talking about the bolts. Um, the way they've just created um, a stable platform with all the, the design and engineering of that. All right. 
Now, um, again, that's on the dash 5A. We do not have this in the dash 5B. Okay. Now, what about the fuel nozzles themselves? So we have servo valves that are located um, in the HMU, and I don't mean to be remiss here, but to just or tell you real quickly, um, part of the hydromechanical unit are going to be your, your low pressure and high pressure turbo active clearance control valves. Um, so you, you have those in there as well. Okay, just kind of a, a deal there. Now, the nozzles themselves, you, you know, I don't know if you remember from you know, a long time ago when you were studying for your AMP, you know, you, you've, you know, you've got different types of sprays, you know, because you're talking about the angle at which it sprays out. Um, with the fuel nozzles here, um, it's, it has to make sure it's in a certain angle, so that way it's covering as much of that mixture, I'm talking about the mixture, I'm talking about the air fuel mixture, um, that's, even, that's distributed as evenly as it can so that it can meet the demands at that point. Okay, and you have also an efficient burning with the way that the fuel nozzles are distributing that fuel. All right, so with here you've got, of course, the nozzles which are around the combustion uh, combustion uh, case area. And remember what I said, you could have 10 and 10 or 20 on the one manifold in the dash 5B. It really doesn't matter. Bottom line is those all are being utilized um, at different points in time and different um, configurations as far as how many nozzles are used at one time, at any given time. So again, no big deal. Just know that you're going to have some um, different angles of spray in order for the efficient burning of in the combustion chamber. Okay. Remember also that pressure has, you know, is a big part of all of this. Um, your fuel pressure is, you know, that needs to be there. Um, that's going through the nozzle to go to the combustion chamber. Um, of course, you have a check valve, uh, it, you know, a, a part of this. So that, that happens around 15 PSIG, uh, be, you know, before going in. So just so you know, about 15 PSI, you've got the fuel um, that opens the check valve. So you have a check valve there. Now, the fuel foot pressure can get to you know get high so when you have the fuel pressure pressure excuse me that's reaching 120 then you have a flow divider uh, metering valve that's going to open okay and that's going to allow fuel to go through uh, a tube um, to support another port in that whole metering um, configuration I mean, basically what it's doing is just, it's just allowing a distribution, a proper distribution on secondary flow of um, fuel for the, for the secondary spray um, in the combustion chamber. Okay. All right, so that gives you an idea on the fuel nozzle operation, kind of familiar with the fuel nozzles, the manifolds, you know, whether it's two or one manifold that we have. Um, there are 20 nozzles total in total. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to, you know, I told you we would, you know, go into talking about the cooler assemblies, because remember I said besides the application of fuel for thrust of the aircraft, we are also using that fuel for the cooling of engine and IDG oil. So we have two different cooler assemblies, one for each, okay, and there's a difference as far as, um, you know, where we're looking at um, the dash of 5A, dash 5B, but just to give you an idea, let's just start with our IDG um, and then just kind of work our way from there um, on the engine oil. But it's very similar, obviously, in concept because, you know, as far as the cooling goes, we're still dealing with an exchanger. But here with the IDG oil cooler assembly, you know, what makes up, you know, what do we have in this assembly? Um, we've, you know, we're going to be still having fuel coming from the HMU and that's returning back to the oil fuel heat exchanger. Now there is an IDG oil cooler. So where is this located? We've got an, a designated IDG oil cooler and that's located on the fan case itself. 
that's just above the engine oil kind of makes sense the um, engine oil tank and you know you've got a, a matrix that's providing that exchange of energy right okay And also just keep in mind, you got, there's an indication when engine oil is pretty hot. When you have engine oil temperature high, guess what? You're going to have IDG oil temperature. Um, you know, that's also going to be pretty high. Okay, so it's, it has to be cooled. Um, with the IDG oil cooler itself, remember I said it's located on the fan case. Um, it's just, a, you know, I say casing. I mean, a lot of these components are made out of aluminum um, as far as uh, threats to I say threats to the integrity of it um, again just watch for any thing that may look like a, a fracture or you know something doesn't look right maybe it's dented uh, you don't want to have uh, you know um, any kind of um, dents that might uh, threaten the integrity of the functioning of that I know it's a case, but still, you know, you just those are the things that, that need to be paid attention to. But that's that's what you have with the oil cooler, um, as far as the case that it's in, and um, of course you have your your ports, you know, with that. Pretty standard. Okay. All right. So, cooler assembly uh, is taking that oil from the IDG, and it's cooling it. Um, it's going to be taking that from again using fuel engine fuel to cool it in that heat exchanger okay and remember keep in mind the difference with as far as positions or locations whether you're working with the dash 5a or dash 5b and the posi position of the oil cooler assembly your dash 5a it's it's on the fan case as well uh, do look at your manuals where it's located because they are in two different positions. Um, why? I have no idea. I mean, like, I know that when it comes to design and engineering, you know, certainly the idea of the next variant is to improve the efficiency. And when you are looking at systems engineering, you want to make sure that you can position components based on their operations in either close proximity or maybe not in close proximity, depending on you know that flow you know of the pro of the process so just kind of I don't know there's a little side note I guess to you but that's why you'll see some positions differently you know where okay this was located at the seven o'clock this was located at the 530 position well you know gee doesn't seem like much of a difference but again from a design or systems engineering standpoint um, it, it may make a difference you know um, in cutting some of the waste if you will of energy Okay, all right, so we just mentioned the oil cooler, um, placed a couple of different, you know, locations not very far from each other from the, as far as when you're comparing where it's located on the dash 5A versus the dash 5B. Okay. And of course, again, you got the tubes associated with that. Um, but anyway, that's kind of pretty much it on that. Um, all right. And kind of the other thing you have um, is the fuel return valve. Um, the fuel return valve, because here we're going to be looking at what the fuel return valve is about and how it interfaces with other components. Remember I mentioned about sensors and about your TPQ, your temperature, pressure, and quantity of a fluid. It's, it, you have to have sensors that are going to send signals to the ECU or FADIG, eventually FADIG, um, in order to then have a readjustment and say, okay, now we have new instruction based on that feedback. And with this fuel return valve, um, as, as far as, you know, what it, you know, what is it doing? Remember what I said about the process. You've got aircraft fuel tanks, all that's being pressurized, going into heat exchangers, being filtered, and then eventually having that wonderfully ideal, you know, fuel that's ice free and just the right temperature uh, and cleanliness is going to the hydro mechanical unit that's going to go to the fuel nozzles. Well, you've also got return. Remember, so you got supply lines and return lines for fuel. Um, you've got also this fuel return valve 
um, returns part of that fuel in that whole system, um, it's going to be returning some of that to the tanks. And, you know, why is it doing that? Okay, we, we're having a little bit of return because it's using that to, you know, for cooling purposes. Um, and that's going to be cooling for the fuel itself and, you know, also for the IDG uh, oil. Okay, where's this fuel return valve located? It's on the fan engine, it's the, you know, on the fan inlet case um, on a bracket. Okay, that's going to be above the IDG oil cooler. So that's where the FRV or the fuel return valve is located. Quickly, where is it located? <laughs> it's located above the IDG oil cooler. That might be a test question, just saying. All right, so the interfaces, what do you have with the fuel return valve? You're going to have obviously tubes. You got drain tubes, you, um, your pump high pressure and low pressure tubes. Um, you got a, the IDG cooler inlet tube, because remember, remember I said that this is relating to cooling um, capacity for the IDG oil, right? And of course you have electrical connectors, have to have that. All right, so that's what it's doing, that, that um, return valve is to kind of bypass that, that fuel from, that's coming from the HMU. Um, in order to maintain the cooling for the IDG oil, okay, and also for the engine oil because it's, you know, we got an exchange, right, the exchanger there, heat exchanger with the uh, engine fuel and oil. The valve itself, as far as if you want to know the subcomponents of that, I mean, in, in itself, it's a component, but if you really want to break this down a little further, um, you've got shutoff valve, the pilot valve, you know, associated with that. Uh, metering system, you got solenoid valves as well. Um, your metering valves, of course, you got a flow control because you're you've got a moving fluid, so we want to measure that. Um, so you've got this with the F um, with the fuel return valve fuel flow. Um, you've got you've got a sensor. Okay, you've got control units as well. Okay, right. So just kind of think of the fuel return valve as controlling the flow of the fuel for the purpose I just said, because that's what it's doing. It's also, it's also kind of watching that, that temperature. So remember back to all that. Okay. And we'll hear from Rick a little bit more about the operations from the cockpit. Um, I think it helps you as an AMT just to get it from a pilot's mouth. Um, in perspective, um, he has have he's has thirty some years of experience as a pilot, but mostly he's he's also very good at communicating and has very much communicated with the line mechanics um, and having great conversations, you know, about all of that. So I'm just sharing with you. He's very much involved with helping you. Just you know, by his sharing, you know, what his perspective is with all of this. Okay. Yeah, I remember I mentioned about sensors. I said, okay, now we're gonna, you know, talk about this stuff. Um, regarding the interfaces with the fuel return valve, is you have temperature sensors. You also have quantity sensors. Remember I said about, you know, again, your 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 quantity, temperature, pressure. You have to have sensors in order to have those messages or that information, the data being sent to the controllers, which are going to be your FADIC and ECU. And here we have two temperature sensors that are located on the lower part of each tank. Remember where those aircraft fuel tanks are, they're in the wings in the center of the body of the aircraft. So the wings is where you have those tanks. And those are where the sensors are located. Makes sense, right? Okay, so those are temperature sensors. Um, there are certain, can, you know, obviously critical temperatures where, you know, signals something that's you know, maybe too cold or, or too hot. You also have full uh, level, full level sensors, and there are four of those. You got two in each tank um, to tell, you know, whether or not they're full. 
Um, you have overflow sensors as well. Um, you got the shutoff sensors. Those are your shutoff. Um, basically, if there's a, if there's not enough poundage of fuel in the tanks, um, or if there's a, a, a certain amount, um, and it's just kind of a ballpark. But you know, if it's greater than a certain number of pounds of fuel, then those sensors are going to send that signal and information to um, to the ECU and the FADIC. Okay. So it's pretty cool that way. All right. That pretty much does it. Um, I can, um, you know, just keep in mind power uh, input starts with a pilot on purpose. Okay, so you're in the cockpit, right? here, but the pilot's in the cockpit, and you start, or if you're doing maintenance, obviously you're sitting in the pilot seat, check, you know, doing checks and tasks. You know, you're going to start, you're going to hit that switch, right? The engine master switches come on, and boom, there everything just kind of goes from there. So the power input and management, management comes from the FADEC and the ECU both and all of that then begins this process of the aircraft fuel being pressurized because it needs to move <laughs> okay you have to have something to boost it around boost it through the system and that's going to be your pump so you have your fuel pump fuel pump is a two-stage pump remember low pressure and high pressure that also has filters because what's our objective we want to have clean ice free not too hot fuel in the combustion chambers of the engines. We also want to have a metering of that, that fuel at any given point in time because of the demand requirements at any given point in time. We've also talked about the hydromechanical unit being a very, very important, go, uh, just a very critical component that receives these instructions from the FADIC and ECU as to what that amount is you know, to send over to the fuel nozzles that go to spraying into the mixture in the combustion chamber. Okay, so all of that process, um, we talked about the valves, the fuel return valve. We talked about the cooling aspect, you know, the application of fuel being used to cool the engine oil and the IDG oil through cooler assemblies. Okay, we went over a little bit about the cooler assemblies, where they're located. Don't get too hung up on, gee, you know, it's right here at the 7 o'clock. Well, it depends. Are you looking at the Dash 5A or Dash 5B variant on that engine? So, again, don't get hung, too hung up on that part. Just get a general idea um, of locations. Obviously, they're going to be near um, either accessory gearbox or the fan case and where are they located roughly, okay? So we've covered a lot of material. If you have questions about any particular subtopic, um, please email us and ask your question. Um, and also, if Rick's going to give a little more information because fuel leaks are important, <laughs> obviously, um, fuel leaks need to be addressed. Now, when the in obviously when the aircraft starts, to move, you know, get started up, there may be a little, you know drippage there somewhere but it's minor it's not a big deal but if it continues um certainly after you know two or three minutes or like there's something's continuing on obviously everybody needs to stop okay something's wrong we need to address it we need to investigate where that's coming from so i would say that would be your big like that's your threat right there is you know fuel leaks all right well i've enjoyed sharing this information with you um look forward to having you in our other topic lessons